Were the Clovis a people or a technology? You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, monsters and serpents, to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, episode 114. Coming to you Desert. not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. I am looking at it in an enormous new monitor donated to Snake Bros, courtesy of the Propanator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that thing is beautiful. Yeah, I just want to sit here. I'm just sitting here staring at it. <laughs> Thanks, Propanator. <laughs> yeah. You are quite the superhero. That's right. <laughs> quite the superhero. So we have, um, we have a trip coming up. We're actually leaving tomorrow morning early to go up to the northeast. We're going to Vermont uh, to hang out, and we're going to look at some ancient stuff. So hopefully we'll be reporting to you from there. Uh, we know we will be pr- reporting when we get back. Uh, we may record some things while we're there, take some video. Uh, we're going to go on a couple of expeditions, but mostly it's going to visit family. So, Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what we're going to do for this episode. I had something else totally – I had something else planned, and then that fell through because I forgot we were leaving tomorrow. So <laughs> I have no material for this episode. <laughs> That's cool. We BSed our way through the first 50 episodes. <laughs> That's right. I think we could handle it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And we are still waiting on the watcher. He says he's going to join us. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. But uh, he should be showing up soon here. Anyway, so we'll just go ahead and start with Space Weather News from SpaceWeather.com. Arctic Aurora Watch. A stream of solar wind flowing from a southern hole in the sun's um, atmosphere could graze Earth's magnetic field on September 17th through 18th. Arctic sky watchers should be alert for auroras mixed with moonlight when the gaseous material arrives. Studies show that September is one of the very best months for auroras. At this time of year around the Arctic Circle, the lights often appear for no apparent reason. That is exactly what happened last night. With no geomagnetic storm to provoke a display, one appeared anyway. Uh, some pictures were taken from, wow, Rova Naimi, Finland. These were quite bright auroras lighting up the sky, even with the nearly full moon as competition. This was the best show of the season so far without exaggeration. What supercharges the auroras of September? It is called the Russell McFerrin effect, named after the researchers who first explained it. During the weeks around equinoxes, cracks open in Earth's magnetic field and solar wind pours in and fuels unexpected displays of aurora borealis. Stay tuned for even more as the actual equinox approaches on September 23rd. I wonder if... So you've got the the magnetic poles of the Earth perpendicular to the direction of the solar wind. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So maybe that's why, like, it's... Because, you know, the diagrams that show a magnet and it's got all the... Right. You know, the the field kind of coming out the pole and then circling around. So around the outside of, of... whatever the direction of the pole is, you're going to have the thinnest proton density. (laughs) (laughs) I'm really bad at predicting (laughs) proton densities. Yeah. But I figured that out last week. (laughs) But right. Like on the actual pole, it seems like it would be the the densest in terms of the magnetic field. Oh, yeah. Whatever that is. Yes, yes. Yeah. I know. I see. I I think that's actually Tesla's or something. Yeah. Tesla is like. What a Tesla is? You're talking about this magnetic field strength? Yeah, they named it after yeah. Tesla, Nikola yeah. Tesla, right? I don't know if that's the right thing either. But Yeah, so what I, I was thinking the same thing, that because what you have to think about with the solar wind is the sun's magnetic field. The, right. the solar wind coming from the sun is in line with the sun's magnetic field, which is obviously straight up and down north-south in terms of the ecliptic. So the Earth is tilted to that, but during the equinox... Is when our when our magnetic field, even though the, even through the tilt, matches up with the, the best, and so the the solar flux can come through in some places. I think that's oh, what okay. they're. T- I think that's what they're talking. I about. had it totally wrong. <laughs> I was thinking of this stuff coming directly out from the sun. Yeah, that's right. Hitting us directly on, not coming down. Yeah, yeah, up. that's that's right. It's it's hitting us directly. Yeah. Okay. And I was just thinking that. I mean, I don't know. I, my the picture that happened in my mind was that the the Earth's magnetic field is not going to line up with the solar wind no matter what because we're right. tilted. 
right? But during the equinox, the tilt is like alongside of it rather than towards it or away from it. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So that it allows more to come through because it's the closest alignment we'll get. Hmm. I was thinking of completely the opposite. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I have no idea. I don't either. <laughs> I, maybe I should look this up. The Russell, what, what is it called? The Russell McFerrin effect. Let's see. It's a link here. Let me see if I can pull it up. It sounds like you're kicking around McFerrins. <laughs> <laughs> Rustling those McFerrins. Site cannot be link reached. Link fails to follow. Oh. That sucks. But as you know, folks, we here at Snake Bros Institute for Advanced Copperlight Studies <laughs> like to uh, um, conjecture. Yeah. On uh, <laughs> we're just like making it up on the spot. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Here's what I think is no happening, even though I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> Mansering. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, current conditions anyway, solar wind speed 430.7 kilometers per second, and the density is 6.2 protons per cubic centimeter. Mm. So maybe... Uh, My career for predicting protons, proton density is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So maybe during the, one of the breaks, I'll look up this effect, and because this link that they've given here doesn't, doesn't work. That's too bad. Yeah. Wait, let me see if I can look up cracks. That was also a link. <laughs> cracks in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, let's see if this one works. So, you know, like, imagine... Cracks in Earth's magnetic ah, field. Yeah. yeah, you got it. By NASA. This is NASA's website. Lies. <laughs> <laughs> Immense cracks in our planet's magnetic field can remain open for hours. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, okay. Earth is surrounded by a magnetic force field, a bubble in space called the magnetosphere. Tens of thousands of miles wide. Although many people don't know it exists, the magnetosphere is familiar. It is a far-flung part of the same planetary magnetic field that deflects compass needles here on Earth. And it is important the magnetosphere acts as a shield that protects us from solar storms. According to new observations, however, from NASA's Image spacecraft and the joint NASA-European Space Agency cluster satellites, immense cracks sometimes develop in Earth's magnet magnetosphere and remain open for hours. This allows solar wind to gush through and power stormy space weather. So we've discovered that our magnetic shield is drafty like a house with a window stuck open during a storm, says Harold Frey of the University of California, Berkeley, lead author of a paper on this research published December 4th in Nature. The house deflects most of the storm, but the couch is ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, our magnetic shield takes the brunt of space storms, but some energy slips through its cracks, sometimes with enough to cause problems with satellites, radio communication, and power systems. The new knowledge that the cracks are open for long periods can be incorporated into our space weather forecasting computer models to more accurately predict how space weather is influenced by violent events on the sun. Uh, let's see. Earth's magnetosphere de generally does a good job of deflecting the particles from the sun and snarled magnetic fields carried by CMEs. Even so, space storms and their vivid effects like auroras, which light up the sky over the polar regions with more than 100 million watts of power, have long indicated that the shield was not impenetrable. In 1961, uh, Jim Dungey of the Imperial College, United Kingdom, predicted that cracks might form in the magnetic shield when the solar wind contained a magnetic field that was oriented in the opposite direction to a portion of the Earth's field. Okay, so I was totally wrong. If it's flipped or opposite, I don't know if they mean opposed to it or if it's completely flipped over. So in other words, if a CME comes off the sun that's oriented the wrong way, yeah. that will open up cracks. Ah. That's what this Got says. Uh, I just don't know what that they, makes sense. Yeah. In these regions, the two magnetic fields would interconnect through a process known as magnetic reconnection, forming a crack in the shield through which the electrically charged particles of the solar wind could flow. In 1979, Goetz Pashman of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany detected the cracks using the International Sun Earth Explorer spacecraft. However, since this spacecraft only briefly passed through the cracks during its orbit, it was unknown if the cracks were temporary features or if they were stable for long periods. In new observations, the imager for magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration, or IMAGE, satellite revealed an area almost the size of California in the Arctic upper atmosphere where a 75-megawatt proton aurora floated, flared for hours. A proton aurora is a form of northern lights caused by heavy solar ions striking Earth's upper atmosphere, causing it to emit ultraviolet light, invisible to the human eye but, but detectable by the far ultraviolet imager on IMAGE. 
While this aurora was being recorded by image, the four satellite cluster constellation flew far above, directly through the crack, and detected solar wind ions streaming through it. So they got correlation there. Hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. The stream of solar wind ions bombarded our atmosphere in precisely the same region where the image where image saw the proton aurora. The fact that image was able to view the proton aurora for more than nine hours implies that the crack remained open continuously. Researchers estimate that the crack was twice the size of Earth at the boundary of our magnetic shield, about 38,000 miles above the planet's surface. Since the magnetic field converges as it enters the Earth in the polar regions, the crack narrowed to about the size of California down near the upper atmosphere. That's interesting stuff. <clears throat> Fortunately, yeah. these cracks don't expose Earth's surface to the solar wind. The atmosphere protects us even when our magnetic field doesn't. The effects of solar storms are felt mainly in the high upper atmosphere and the region of space around Earth where satellites orbit. That doesn't really answer my question of... Yeah, what are... How do the cracks work? Yeah. But that's cool. Yeah. I think we'll just try to do more research later. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I want to know what this Russell, cracks. Russell McFerrin effect is. That's what I want to know. Okay. That's so, where you just like, you know, you get McFarrett all, all right, all riled up. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know who McFerrin is. It was just my yeah. theory. It was oh. the Russell theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So I got some stuff from some listeners here. Uh, let's see, which one do I want to start with here? Okay, so let's start with one from Robert, who was one of our Patreon supporters. He says, uh, this is the guy who asked us to look into the um, suspicious observers stuff, right? So he says, hi again, Snake Bros. Thank you so much for looking into and discussing what I sent you. I had many problems and questions with Sun micronova as well, but after I watched Diehold Foundation videos about the same topic, I got more clarity on how and why it occurs. Douglas Vogt explains everything about it really nicely, even though he is a little bit egotistical at times. Douglas has been working on that stuff from the 80s or even the 70s, if I'm correct. Douglas has a few more video series, which all ties together with that same topic and much more. I'm quite sure you guys would be really interested in those topics. But anyway, really enjoyed the last episode and hope you guys watch his playlist about the same topic and waiting on new episodes with you discussing it even more. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually... The part that I had the least amount of problem with was the micronovas. Uh, so that's, but I think he's talking about he isn't talking about the uh, the episode where we where I did a, more of a deep dive into it. He's talking about the one before where I just oh, sort okay. of mentioned it. Um, I think I don't know because I mean I don't have a problem with micronoving. Uh, what I have a problem, what I don't understand are some of the some of the the, the uh, terrestrial mechanics that happened because of that and the things that they were saying about that, showing things as proof. Like, one thing I don't understand is, like, okay, if we're about to have a magnetic pole flip, which seems like that's, or something's happening with a magnetic field, and it, and it looks like the weakening plus the wander is culminating in some kind of a pole flip. Magnetic pole flip, okay? But then they also argue that micronovas, like, decouple the crust from the, from the mantle right. and allow it to move around. But then at the same time, they say, but the the pole f pole shifts go back and forth to the same places so you see the magnet so you see the pole in the same place over millions of years i don't understand that uh, that part i didn't get how can you how can both of them be flipping and both of them be flipping sort of randomly but you end up where it looks like the pole's been in the same place for m for millions of years that doesn't make any yeah, sense yeah cuz if the crust shifts at all and the pole stays in the same place then it'll it's, look like it's in a different spot yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we're going to be looking at at the at these rocks in the ground, and it's going to have them going one way and another way and another way. Right. But so, they typically only go north and then south, and then north and then south. Right. Yeah. Which implies a magnetic shift. A magnetic but, shift, but not, but not a, a, a crustal, crustal shift. one, or, or yeah, or any other kind of. Yeah. Or especially not one where the whole planet rolls over somehow. Like I, that could happen, you know, if a large body passed nearby, but that would be the only way I think on that. And of course, Velikovsky is like, yeah, Venus this or mars yeah well I, you know it makes sense too that that if you have this this weighting on the poles due to centrifugal force it's going to want to drag 
the the most massy portion of the crust to the equatorial yes. uh, region, right? Yep. I agree with that. Yeah. That's, that makes sense mm-hmm. to me. So if there was this possibility of decoupling, you could imagine it sort of wobbling out, you know, the heavy part at the pole wobbling out until it roughly reaches the... Yeah, but then how does it go back to exactly where it was later? Yeah. That's the part I'm talking about. I don't know. It seems more likely that the ice would decouple itself from the crust. Right. Yeah, that the ice would let go of the land it's on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know. The, you know. Because of, you know, it's hot under there. So you've already got this sort of liquid surface underneath. Oh, okay, yeah. If it's not frozen all the way to the ground, you yeah. mean? Yeah. I mean, there are... There, there's pretty think, good data for, for that happening. I mean, and also gl- uh, glaciers drift. We, we know that. Yeah. They leave trails. Yeah. And there have been, there has been major ice cover in places that doesn't make any sense. And in places where it looks like the ice was going the wrong direction, you know, flowing south to the north. It's going to go downhill. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, the source is usually the north and it will flow into the south. But there, but it isn't getting ice from the south. You know what I mean? I see. Like in other words, like the snow is all landing on top of the mountain, but the glacier is all the way down in the valley. Yeah. But the source of it is the top way of the mountain. Way up there, yeah. Yeah. So when you have like lower southern regions, and those seem to be where the wa- the ice was forming and flowing towards the north from, that doesn't make any sense. Unless it was way higher in altitude. Yeah. Right. Unless there, without massive crustal movements, whether through isostasy or yeah. vertical movements of the crust. Not necessarily like moving around on the, on the sphere itself. Uh, yeah. So like I don't. So anyway, the point I'm getting at here is that I can see the sun doing super flares or micronovas. I don't have a problem with that. I do have issues with. I don't understand the the mechanisms of like how you can have a, a magnetic magnetic flips once every once in a while and the crust moving every once in a while and have it still be like it looks like the poles are in the same places over millions of years. I just don't, yeah. I don't get that. And your point last from the last podcast about how it doesn't this doesn't seem to match up with the ice core data yeah. is a good point. Like if this is happening quite often, then why do we have so much ice, you know, in Greenland? Unless yeah. they're completely measuring the ice wrong somehow. Which seems unlikely. Unlikely. <laughs> I mean there's gonna be you know, there's gonna be pollen layers. Yeah. Right? Yep. Over and over. Every every season, you know, when when the Earth goes back through a season where these these pollens show up, yeah, it's going to be deposited in the ice, right? And then there's going to be l- portions of the ice without it, and then it's going to come back, and you know, so you could pretty much, yeah, just, just gonna, as an example, yeah. you could count that as a year, right? The the ice is going to have a clock of some kind, yeah. So without massive disruptions, that could confuse everything, right? Basically. Um, then but would, that would be that would be pretty obvious too, right? When you get into the core, yeah, that there, that you've got this regular deposition, and then at some point it's all jumbled up, right? Yeah. Okay, a massive cataclysm happened here, right? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> uh, let's see. We should use dendrochronology. <laughs> <laughs> I just like that word. <laughs> okay, so I got an email here from Drew. He's got a whole bunch of stuff in here. He says he lives in Mississippi and the talks of burial mounds and giants on the continent piqued his interest. So he's going to start looking around at that. He also gives us some recommendations to look at. But I wanted to read just basically what he says about the podcast. He says, I just found your podcast recently and really enjoy it. Thank you for not getting sucked too far into conspiracies and the institutions they are tied to. Also, thank you for reading pertinent material on air. These two things really enhance the listening experience. Keep it up. Cheers. Ah. Drew. Hey, Russ does all that reading. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks anyway, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's got some great recommendations. For, I'm going to look into some of this stuff on the, the burial mounds. Uh, I do some reading. Yeah. I did the Anzic one. 
Yeah. It's secret. the most I've read on podcasts in like <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. From David, uh, this, is, uh, this is another one from David. For many weeks, your podcast has been a favorite of mine to play while enjoying a pipe. And now I hear you have several. Mm. Are you new to the pastime or continuing a long-held practice? If new, I hope you have good pipe tamping tools and matches of convenient length. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> Noob. <laughs> yeah. So, uh... He talks about some, he ordered tobacco from a place he loves and he offered to send us some. So I was like, hell yes. <laughs> Heck yes. <laughs> so, and I told him we were pipe noobs. And he goes, okay, Snake Brothers, welcome to the piping pastime. Thank you for the address. I'll send some blends along to you in the next two or three weeks or so. What have you enjoyed so far? The shaken or stirred question of pipes is English or aromatics. I like some of both and may send you the three blend sampler I got myself recently. Uh. In addition to your pipes and one tamper, I say that there should ideally be one tamper per person. Otherwise, it is almost like sharing a serving spoon. <laughs> Tampers are incredibly important. I'd never have a pipe without one. <clears throat> also, keep your tobacco not in the bags or tins or any plastic. Plastic can really ruin the taste of tobacco even over a week. Keep it in jars. You will notice over time that some blends deepen and get more round with time. Uh, let's see. He gives us some recommendations on learning about pipes. Okay, so this is all something I should look into for you when I am in Italy is a, the gravitational anomaly off the east side of Capri. Uh, Capri? I'm not sure how to say it, near where I live. When Goeth visited, he wrote of his ship to Sicily being nearly sucked into the rocks because of this odd current. Wow. We now know it is gravity itself. In the attached map, the tiny purple dot in the middle of all the red is where I live. So he sent us some maps. So there's a little bitty purple dot right there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the Gulf of Naples, Naples is shallow and likely an extinct volcanic crater. It is very circular and is ringed by many extinct and one active volcano. The Gulf was dry 15,000 years ago. A short distance away, an hour walk from one bay to the other, the Gulf of Salerno had an ice age coastline extremely similar to ours today because of the steep cliffs there continue under the sea many hundreds of feet. Capri has this feature too, but is a small island. The large vertical mass of rock partway into the water pulls at the surface of the water in a consistent way, creating a slope in the ocean that can be dangerous to boats. That is <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it is the land of the sirens. We are just starting to truly understand gravity, I thought Neil deGrasse Tyson was a tiny bit unfair to Joe Rogan on that issue lately. So, enjoy the pipes. Thanks for the address and your great content. I will keep you posted, David. Oh, man. <laughs> thanks for the, uh, for the pipe knowledge. So, uh, also, thanks to Scotty Baldwin. Yes. The one who sent us sent the, pipes, the pipes. Yes. And they're beautiful. And I uh, smoked cigarettes for years and years and then switched to a vape and that thing made me cough and I was getting angry at it. <laughs> and so Scotty sent us the pipes and I went out and bought uh, the, I don't know, our local ice house had yeah. this one pack. You know, I was asking them about pipe tobacco. Of course, they're not going to have a large selection, but they had this one. It was called Captain Black. So I bought it and it was good. You know, I was impressed Yeah, from the Ice House. They, they have good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just finished it. It was 1.5 ounces. And I noticed that like a pool of liquid forms in the bottom of the pipe by the time you finish the one bowl. Yeah, you're using one of the deep bowl pipes. Yeah, it's yeah. deep bowl. Yeah. So by the end, you're basically vaping. <laughs> 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 but... Anyway, so I, I think you told me he mentioned something about the carbon filters. Yes, filters, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. But yeah, they're, it's really great. Super smooth. Yeah, so apparently you can uh, unscrew the, the mouthpiece. Yeah, you and can then just get pull one, the mouthpiece out. Yeah, yeah, and then get one with a filter in it. Oh, okay. It. Yeah, or something, right. like, something like that. Or get one that will that filters can go into. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. But it's uh, quite enjoyable, and um, I agree with the temper thing. Because, like, I realized I'd put that tamper away after I loaded a bowl. Yeah. And then I would need it again. <laughs> <laughs> so now I just carry it around with me. Yeah. It's, it's like if I'm smoking the pipe, the tamper's in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's very ritualistic, the whole process. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, much appreciated. 
Yeah, uh, the can't wait to try that tobacco. You uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, this is from watch Se- out for ATF. <laughs> this is from Sebastian. <laughs> Says hi guys. Not sure if you have done anything focused on Nan made all yet. I'm still working my way through the back catalog, but I'm sure you agree about how fascinating that place is. Anyway, love your work. Great podcast. I'll be making a t- contribution to the pyramid scheme soon when I sell a car. Oh. And I hope to buy a hoodie off the mech site. If it works. <laughs> Cheers, Sebastian. <laughs> Heck yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks for the promise of the donation, buddy. And yes, we have talked about Nam at all. We should probably do a deep dive into it at some point. Yeah. Uh, we've, I, we've talked about it off and on just like so many other topics, but never focused a whole podcast on it. So, yeah, I, I don't think. I can't remember which one that is. That's the Lincoln Logs place. Oh, out yeah, in the yeah, Pacific. yeah, yeah. 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 Stay away from that place. Oh, coffee <laughs> <laughs> yeah. cart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Run off, check it out, never come back. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is from, this is another Patreon comment. Robert, from Robert. The tangent cube question mark? These are things we need to know. Is the tangent cube actually a cube? Or does it have a roof like in the website picture? Is the quote unquote tangent because of its geometry or because of the contents of your skull cabbages being tangentially aligned to the standard model? <laughs> Where can we buy Snake Bros custom butt flaps like the one you wear whilst making the podcast? <laughs> Without this knowledge, us snake flappers cannot construct our impossible lock altars to the bro gods of the butt cast who speak through the snaking cables of the tree of no knowledge, where we hang our authentically forged certificates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to all of those <laughs> questions. <laughs> Uh, this is awesome. The tree of no knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, is there a picture of the of the tangent cube on the website? No. I, well, I put a picture up of a very small shed cube with a roof on it that said, this is not the tangent cube, but it could be. Oh, okay. Because I don't actually have a picture of <laughs> <Okay>. it. Okay. <laughs> sure. And yes, it looks close to that. This roof is not quite as steep because that one's in the mountain somewhere. Yeah. So it's got a snow roof on it. This one's this one's pretty shallow. So yeah, it's a ten by ten building, ten right. foot by ten foot shed. Shed. It has been converted into a studio, but it is off the ground a little bit. Maybe we should go really measure from the ground. Yeah. To the ceiling, but it is a it is a um, um, it's just a prefab vaulted ceiling. I guess. Yeah, you would call it's prefab. It. I can't what it's you called. know, Stash is going to nail me for that. Shed. It's just one of those shed where you can basically go to Home Depot and be like, I want that one. And then they come install it in your yard. Gabled. I yeah. I think it is. <clears throat> yeah. So it's 10 by 10. Yeah. But maybe not by 10. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that tall. <laughs> but it is. Yeah. Sort of. It's, it's a cube. That's what we call it. <laughs> it's the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube. Yeah. And it's because it's tangent. It's tangential. Because uh, yeah, the roof is tangential, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but we, it's it's all about the subject matter, right? It's it's the contents of our skull cabbages. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a freaking great comment. Yeah, and uh, we are working on the butt flaps. Yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, uh, hey. You know, butt That's, flaps are really a do-it-yourself project. <laughs> Ask any butt flapper, and they'll tell you that you just need to go out with your stone knife. I've made one. Kill something, <laughs> skin it, <laughs> use something else's brain cabbage to like cure the hide. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this is cool. From uh, so there's this guy on Twitter who uh, he's called Pod Doodle, right? So he makes Pod Doodle videos. Mostly, he's done it for. Um, where did the road go up to this point? So he's a fan of Where did the road go? And so what he does is he listens to the show and he starts to, he just opens up a <clears throat> a blank digital page and starts sketching. I'm assuming he's got some kind of a tablet. And he starts sketching while he's listening to the show and he records the whole thing. And then he posts it on YouTube. So you can like watch him sketch while he's listening to the Where did the road go show. And he just covers the page and all these random sketches as the topics continue. It's really fun to watch. Uh, and I asked him a while back, I was like, hey, 
you should do this for our show because <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> and he started listening to our show, but he hasn't done any pod doodles for it yet. But <clears throat> I just got this email from him a little while ago. He says, hi, Snake Bros. My name is Thomas. I make the pod doodle videos. Some time ago, we talked on Twitter about pod doodles inspired by the episodes of Brothers of the Serpent. Is this still something you would be interested in? Most of my viewers have requested the podcast audio instead of music. So in upcoming videos, I aim to use podcast audio as much as possible. Can I use your podcast audio? In my experience, lengthier pod doodles are a bit demanding to produce. It is, of course, doable, but I prefer around 90 minutes or shorter. If the episode is close to two hours or more, I'll have to split it into two parts. Are there any particular episodes you would like me to doodle? Perhaps episodes that have been extra popular or inspiring? I'm not sure, but I think we were talking about the Epic of Gilgamesh, if I remember correctly. Elongated, legless, carnivorous reptiles, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> From Sweden. <laughs> so I said, hey man, yes. I think having the podcast audio and the vids would be great. And yes, you can use our audio. Just make sure to provide a link to our feed in the notes. We will also start plugging your channel at the ends of our shows once you start making the vids. The Epic of Gilgamesh episode would be a great one to start with. I think it's episode 67. We can also ask listeners which ones they'd like to see done. Oh, that's that's for all idea. you guys out there. And I said, hope you are prepared to draw a lot of pyramids. <laughs> 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 so I just got this from him today. Hi, that's awesome. I'm rendering the first half of it right now. We'll upload later this evening and tell you on Twitter as soon as it is up. I will make the second half tomorrow. Your idea about asking the listeners sounds great. And then he goes, Ja, I am from Sweden, so I can't understand this part. A link to our feed? <laughs> I guess that you want me to put a link to your website? It's the reason I, he's got all <laughs> these umlauts and stuff. In. <laughs> or do you mean a link to the Snake Bros Twitter feed or anything else? Do you want to have particular copyright info or similar in the video description? Yes, I can draw many pyramids. Bork, bork. Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> So he has posted the first one. On, it is on Twitter as we speak. It is the first half of the episode of Gil, uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Snake Bros episode, and he will be posting the second one tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. So everybody check out his channel on YouTube, Pod Doodle. It's really cool. And uh, we'll be plugging him at the end of the shows from now on. So. <laughs> the proton density meme was... Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's been sending us memes about our show <laughs> that really have cracked us up. And also, he's he did a great drawing of us and Soraya. Uh, yeah. Because we did a we did a three-part series with Soraya on Where Did the Road Go about Missing 411. And he drew, like, little, uh, like, you know, sketchy portraits, color yeah. portraits of Kyle and I and Soraya in the middle. Uh, <laughs> it looked really hilarious. Yeah. They were just great. Freaking hilarious. Um, so yeah, he's a good artist and, uh, so you guys should check it out. It's, it's really an entertaining to watch. And I have noticed that like, you know, when you go to watch his videos, it plays music, it plays sort of like a, hmm. you know, and I'm like, no, I want the audio. I want to listen yeah. to the part that he's listening to while it's so, you know, I'm all about it. Cool. Yeah. So he'll be using our audio and this is the first one. So really cool. Right on. All right. Break time. Oh yeah. Snakes. of the Serpent Podcast from the Snake Bros Institute for Advanced Copyright Studies, where there are no degrees, only certificates of ignorance that you have to make yourself <laughs> and print and post on your wall. <laughs> we don't even send them to you. <laughs> yeah. So... Let's go to the news section here. All right. Um, I have some... What do you got? I've got... I just got a real quick thing. Uh, okay. An asteroid larger than some of the world's tallest buildings hmm. 
just passed by Earth on Saturday. Just just some of the world's tallest buildings? Yeah, I know. Oh. I was like, why <laughs> did they that do mean? that? Yeah. It's basically not as big as the tallest building, <laughs> yeah. but bigger than the one <laughs> yeah. that's the next smaller right. tallest building. Uh, but yeah, it passed by at uh, an incredibly close, a 3.3 3 million miles away. <laughs> but of course, I think NASA, or yeah, let's see. This was... Before the asteroid passed, this is from CNN. Fake news dot com. <laughs> On Saturday, an asteroid will pass by Earth's Earth that's larger than some of the tallest buildings on the planet. Asteroid 2000 QW7 is estimated to be between 290 meters and 650 meters in diameter, or between 951 and 2132 feet, according to NASA. The world's tallest building is the Burke Khalifa in Dubai, which reaches 2,717 feet tall. The second tallest building is the Shanghai Tower at 2,073 feet. So it's bigger than that one, but yeah. not as big as Dubai. No, those, are, those buildings are nowhere near as wide as it is, though. Probably not. The asteroid will be traveling at 14,361 miles per hour when it passes within 3,312,000 miles of Earth at 7.54 p.m. Eastern Time. That was Saturday. Uh, astronomers don't believe the asteroid poses a danger, but NASA's Center for Near-Earth Object Studies is tracking it. In June, astronomers showed that telescopes could provide enough warning to allow people to move away from an asteroid strike on Earth. Astronomers at the University of Hawaii used the Atlas and Pan-STARRS survey telescopes to detect a small asteroid before it entered Earth's atmosphere on the morning of June 22nd. The asteroid named... 2019 MO was 13 feet in diameter and 310,685 miles from Earth. The Atlas facility observed it four times over 30 minutes around midnight in Hawaii. Initially, the Scout Impact Analysis software at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory deemed the potential impact as a 2. For reference, 0 is unlikely and 4 is likely. David Farno Farnokia Navigation engineer at JPL requested additional observations because he noticed a detection near Puerto Rico 12 hours later. The Pan-STARRS telescope was also operating and captured part of the sky where the asteroid could be seen. The additional images from the Pan-STARRS telescope helped reach researchers better determine the entry path for the asteroid, which bumped the scout rating to four. The calculation matched up, and weather radar in San Juan detected the asteroid as it burned up in our atmosphere. It entered the atmosphere over the ocean, 236 miles south of the city. Atlas, which is two telescopes 100 miles apart on the Big Island in Maui, scans the entire sky every two nights for asteroids that could impact Earth. It can spot small asteroids half a day before they arrive at Earth and could point to larger asteroids days before. Although much of the knowledge of their capabilities and determinations about the asteroid was worked out after the fact, Astronomers believe that Atlas and Pan Stars could help predict more in the future. Cool. Yeah. So that's a pretty small one for them to be tracking. That's pretty impressive. I think it's yeah, yeah. I think they're getting more serious about this. Yeah. Still no comets though. Those are all no asteroids. comets. All, uh, I haven't no, looked at it. Either. Comets. Those are all asteroids. <laughs> 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 yeah. Read the comments to us. <laughs> I don't see any comments. 641 comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> One of these comments hit me really hard. <laughs> um, yeah, so it kind of starts out telling you about one that that passed by. Yeah. And then... Uses that to tell you about how they... How they are actually like able to track these ones, even really small ones that are actually entering the atmosphere. Yeah. A half a day. Before it happened, yeah. But they're, you know, they're looking at being able to evacuate. Half areas. a day is not long enough. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But if it's bigger, you know, that one was too small to even hit the Earth. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, bigger ones, more lead time, but still, yeah, it would be difficult. How are you going to gonna get a bunch of people off of Hawaii in a day? Yeah, that's going to be hard. Yep. Because it most likely will hit water. Yeah. And then you have to get everyone off of the coastlines. Right. Yeah. Be hard. 
Uh, well, I have a similar story. Well, this one's talking about a very old asteroid. This is uh, from Smithsonian Mag. Ah, fake news mag. <laughs> 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 what happened the day the giant dinosaur-killing asteroid hit the Earth? What happened that day? Yeah. This is, this is really cool. Using rock cores from the Chixi Club, Chixi Lub crater? Geologists pieced together a new timeline for the destruction that followed impact. Okay. One of the greatest scars on our planet is hidden beneath the Yucatan Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. The buried crater, over 90 miles in diameter, was created when a massive asteroid struck the planet 66 million years ago and brought calamitous end to the reign of the dinosaurs. Now, thanks to a new analysis of core samples taken from the crater's inner ring of mountains called a peak ring... Geologists can create a detailed timeline of what happened on the day after impact. Wow, that's cool. This immense crater is a remnant of one of the most consequential days in the history of life on Earth. The asteroid strike triggered the Cretaceous Paleogene, or KP, mass extinction. The catastrophe not only decimated the dinosaurs, leaving only birds to carry their legacy, but also annihilated various forms of life from flying reptiles called pterosaurs to coil-shelled nautilus relatives called ammonites. Lizards, snakes, mammals, and more snuffer, suffered their own setbacks. The best clues to what happened now lie buried in rock layers stacked 12 miles deep. Golly. Yeah. Using a core sample collected in 2016, uh, University of Texas at Austin geologist San Gulick and a team of dozens of other researchers have further pieced together the story of the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction. We interpret this section to represent the first day post-impact, which by the definition of the geological time scale makes it the first day of the Cenozoic since the Cretaceous ended the moment the asteroid struck, he says. The team's study, the first day of the Cenozoic, was published today in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The drill site was selected to investigate the series of events that followed the impact. When an asteroid the size of the Chicxulub impactor, estimated to be more than six miles wide, strikes a planet. Material is ripped up from below the surface and tossed into the air, collapsing in circular mountain ranges within the crater. Such devastating upheaval triggers a cascading sequence of natural disasters, sending tsunamis rolling across the oceans and ejecting an immense amount of debris into the atmosphere. Wait a second. So the ejected material makes circular mountains... Or is the, are they talking about the actual rim of the... Yeah, so the peak ring is the center ring. The center ring, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> that one it's, happens because there's a big splash, and then right. that falls back in and makes a secondary ring. That's what they were talking That's about, the circular mat- yeah. mountain? There's, okay. a, there's a circular, circular mountain range under the water there. Okay, I was, I was thinking they were talking about the stuff that flew out. Makes mountains Le- way out makes there. Makes circular <laughs> mountains way out. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's what the Rockies are? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the core sample is a geologic document stretching hundreds of feet long. Under a thin ring of overlying material is over 400 feet of melt rock that was laid down during the day following the impact. This isn't the first drill core from Chicxulub, says uh, University of New Mexico geologist James Witz. But because of its position on the peak ring, which is essentially a range of mountains created in the moments after the impact event, it provides a really unique picture of the sort of dynamic geological processes that operated over short timescales. An event of this scale has never occurred in human history, he adds, so the rock record is essential to parsing out the details. How does he know that? Yeah, I don't know. Within minutes of the asteroid strike, Gulick and colleagues found the underlying rock at the site collapsed and formed a crater with a peak ring. The ring was soon covered over by 70 feet of additional rock that had melted in the heat of the blast. The sea battered against the new hole in the planet, and in the minutes and hours that followed, surges of water rushing back into the crater carried and laid down more than 260 additional feet of melted stone atop the already accumulated rock. Then it was hit by a tsunami. (laughs) The wave reflected back towards the crater after after the initial impact, added another distinct layer of rock, sediments of gravel, sand, and charcoal all within the first 24 hours of the strike. So the, so the wave goes out and rolls over the land and then is reflected back. So then that comes back and dumps all, all this land material yeah. into the crater. <clears throat> Man, that's, that's crazy. 
The planetary coll collision triggered wildfires inland, burning forests that were later doused by devastating waves. So it sets everything on fire and then rolls water over them to put them out. <laughs> Debris from the charred woods washed out to sea and some accum accumulated in the crater. What we have from drilling at ground zero is a fairly complete picture of how the crater formed and what the processes were within the crater on the first day of the Cenozoic, Gulick says. The impact affected life far from the site. The heat pulse would have raised temperatures over 900 miles away, Gulick says. And, quote, at farther distances, the ejecta could also have caused fires by frictional heating as it rained down in the atmosphere. The rocks that the asteroid struck were rich in sulfur, which was ejected and vaporized, mixing with water vapor and creating what Gulick calls a sulfate aerosol haze. Geologists had detected and studied this effect before, but the new research reinforces the role this atmospheric disruption played in the extinction that followed. Hmm. Our results support this scenario where first you burned parts of the continents, then you had global dimming of the sun and plummeting temperatures for years to follow. These events count for the loss of 75% of known species at the end of the Cretaceous. Had the impact occurred elsewhere or in a place of deeper ocean water, the extinction may have happened differently or not at all. <clears throat> Cores from Chicxulub Crater reveal the planet-wide devastation that the large impactor caused. But the timing of these events will likely spur debate and discussion, Witz says. The complication with relating individual deposits in the core to specific types of events is that clearly the crater wasn't in a static environment after formation, meaning that earthquakes, waves, and other events have altered the rock record over the course of 66 million years since. Still, cores like the one taken from the peak ring show that we can get a close-up look at short-term events in the rock record down to minutes, hours, and days. Scientists knew the first day of the Cenozoic started with a bang, and now they have a better sense of the fallout. So, uh, that's the end of the article there. Man, that's cool. Yeah, so, <clears throat> it's interesting to me that, like, uh, in this case, because they know what they're looking at, right, they dig in through... They've got a, a, a freaking core sample that's so long, and they know it was all made in less than a day. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no problems with that. Yeah, right. Yeah. No problems with that. And yet, when you look at, you know, you look at stuff around the world, if we don't know there was a, a, an enormous event associated with it, you may think that it took millions and millions of years to form those layers. Right. And you may invent whole processes to form those layers because you don't have the, the proxy the, or the, the, the actual... Uh, you know the actual, actual cause the of actual it. cause of yeah. it yeah <clears throat> so I find that interesting that in this case because there's this big crater that's a known thing and it's accepted that this happened all these layers are even though they're they're very thick are accepted to be having been made in hours yeah man I, I don't know it's fascinating to imagine that process like all, all of that stuff happening. Yeah. But from afar. In one way, you want to be there to see it. And in another yeah. way, you don't. Right. <laughs> That's really, it's, it's, uh, yeah. What did he say? 70 or 90%? I can't remember. All 75%. 75% of all the creatures. Yeah. These events could count for the loss of 75% of known species. Wow. Yeah. Known. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. That's a lot. That's killing 75% of all known species on the planet is a lot. Man. Okay. <clears throat> In other asteroid news, <laughs> <laughs> a boulder falls on Virginia Highway after a meteor lights up the night sky, confusing <laughs> many. <laughs> the Charlotte Observer.com. <laughs> This is a confused, I mean, this story is just, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> a boulder came out of nowhere and landed on a Virginia highway overnight, leading to confusion when the timing followed widespread reports of a fireball streaking along the East Coast late Thursday. The American Meteor Society says it received nearly 40 reports from people who saw a fireball over the Carolinas and Virginia, including callers from the Richmond area where the boulder fell. Witnesses said the fireball appeared around 8 p.m., moving to the north, and dash cam video obtained by ABC 11 showed it appeared on the horizon as a bright white ball with a tail of fire. 
Hours later came news that a boulder had mysteriously appeared on a highway <laughs> southeast of Richmond. And it was big enough to throw a passing car onto its roof, Lieutenant Justin oh, Aronson no. of the Chesterfield County Police said on Twitter. Aronson posted photos of the boulder surrounded by orange cones and flares along with an image of the unlucky <laughs> car resting on its front windshield. The rock was the size of a picnic table, TV station WTVR reported. South Australia police released CCTV footage from Mount Gambier in Australia of a meteor lighting up the night sky as it crashed down to Earth on May 21st, 2019. What is this? That's probably... Oh, it's a caption. <clears throat> yeah, a caption for a picture. Sorry. <clears throat> the boulder landed on US 360, also known as Hull Road. H-U-L-L. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> What? <laughs> At around 4 a.m. It didn't take long for some to connect the boulder to the fireball, both on Twitter and Facebook. Quote, did this come from the sky around 8 or 9 last night? One Twitter user wrote, I was sitting at Kroger and saw what looked like to be the biggest meteorite I've ever seen. I seriously waited to hear the sound upon impact, but never did. Quote, I really hope it's not part of the moon, <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> what? Another user tweeted. Part of the moon. <laughs> Quote, it's Friday the 13th and a full moon. Anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> Posted one person on Facebook. As the debate continued, uh, some that there were no skid marks or a large crater to support the meteor theory. Did it have a parachute? Come on, people. They're <laughs> quoting. They're yeah. quoting. A meteorologist at Richmond's NBC 12 spotted the discussion, which included gifts of falling meteors. And he weighed in with a sobering response early Friday. Uh, someone suggested in my timeline that it could be a meteorite. <laughs> Andrew Frieden tweeted, but it is not. <laughs> if it were a meteorite, we would all be dead. <laughs> Hashtag happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, doesn't really, you know. I love that, man. That's yeah. great. Fireball in the sky, boulder rolls into the road. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't do like I, I think that the either the um the reporter here, the journalist, was nowhere near it. Yeah. Or didn't actually go to look to see if it came off of the side of a cliff on the side of the road. Yeah, like no yeah. there's no pictures. <laughs> the cops didn't say anything. I think it's just like the way the story is written, it's almost like they just want to make the connection. And, yeah. Yeah. You know. Like, could it have been? <laughs> yeah. Question mark? <laughs> yeah. Let me not give you enough data to decide for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, that was fun. Uh, and then I have an update. Oh, yeah. Uh, which one of these is that? From. <laughs> nope. <laughs> ENM News. This is the Storm Area 51 update. They're coming. How a joke about Area 51 may lure thousands of party goers. Now, this story. <clears throat> I, I don't really want to read the whole thing, but, uh, well, all right, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> so a wildly popular Facebook joke about storming Area 51 inspired plans for an enormous alien themed party in the Nevada desert. Now there are three events in the works, including one in Las Vegas sponsored by Bud Light. <laughs> The aliens, if they're watching, probably have some questions for humanity. You might too, so here's a closer look at what's happening. The joke. There's not much to it. In late June, Maddie Roberts, a college student, created an event on Facebook called Storm Area 51, They Can't Stop All of Us. <laughs> the event scheduled for September 20th was meant as a joke about making a run on the mysterious and well-protected military test site in South Nevada. The joke caught fire. Within three weeks, more than a million people marked themselves down as planning to attend. By mid-September, the number had reached 2.1 million. Even the Air Force noted, uh, noticed, and in July, a spokeswoman told the New York Times that any attempt to <coughs> illegally access military installations or military training areas is dangerous. <laughs> Concerned that some might take the call to action seriously and be arrested or hurt, Mr. Robert, Mr. Roberts decided to plan a sizable alien stock music festival nearby as an alternative. According to reports, teaming up with Brock Daly, a co-host of the Facebook event, and Connie West of the Little A. Lee Inn 
in rural Rachel, Nevada, which is home to fewer than 100 residents. So we reported on these yeah. uh, developments. <clears throat> the alien is like a... Yeah. Like a, it's, a it's a hotel. Yeah. It's got like 10 rooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the little alien. <clears throat> <laughs> the drama. Mr. Roberts and Mr. Daly parted ways this week. With Miss West, according, and Miss West is the one at the alien. At the alien. Okay. Okay. Uh, according to Frank DiMaggio, an event planner who is now working with the two men, <laughs> Miss West has said that the party in Rachel is still on, according to the Las Vegas Review Journal. But according to a statement, the three men say that it's poised to be Firefest 2.0. A rerun of a famously hyped party in 2017 that failed spectacularly. Mm. Instead, they are directing their followers on Facebook and elsewhere to an event on September 19th, hosted by the downtown Las Vegas Events Center and sponsored by Bud Light, which will sell limited edition alien-themed beers <laughs> at the event, as well as elsewhere in Nevada, Arizona, and California. About 8,000 people are expected to attend, according to a spokeswoman for the center, which can hold up to 12,000 people. So basically, it is storm money grab update. <laughs> it's like all these people are just trying to. This yeah. whole thing is turned into a big money grab fight amongst like four different groups. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. Mm. So they're like fighting over who's going to have the biggest party. And then there's there's one group. I, I should go find this part in the story because this is this is cool. Um, Alien-themed beer. Yeah. Like, it's it's obvious, right? They're going to Vegas yeah. with Bud Light. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're, like, we're trying to be serious. And, and I'm, no, yeah. you're, it's money grab. Bud Light's like, hey, so you guys have like 3 million followers? Uh, yeah. Let's do a party. Yeah. Right? Sure. It's capitalism. Yeah. But <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but still. Um, let's see. Okay, so there is something else going on. <clears throat> let's see. A party of the third kind. While the Rachel <laughs> event was in the works, another group of organizers was planning a gathering for September 20th and 21st in nearby Heiko home to the Alien Research Center, a gift shop. <laughs> While that event, the Storm Area 51 Base Camp, will feature food, drinks, and music, it also includes a lineup of speakers intended to appeal to those interested in aliens and the secretive military base. Quote, We're focusing on true believers. We're not looking for a rave in the desert, said Keith Wright, managing partner of production specialists of Las Vegas, an events company, and one of the organizers of the Base Camp event. The speakers include Jeremy Corbell, the director of a movie on Netflix about Bob Lazar, who says he reverse-engineered alien spaceships at Area 51, both of whom reportedly served as inspiration for Mr. Roberts' Facebook post. In an interview, Mr. DiMaggio gave his blessing to the Heiko event and said that Mr. Roberts was considering checking it out. So, like, there is an actual, like, these guys are doing a real yeah. sort of conference. <clears throat> an alien thing. conference, yeah. In Heiko. But anyway. Well, what do you expect? Yeah. You know, I hope everybody that goes to whatever they're going to has a great time. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like reading this getting disgusted. I'm like, Dude, this is just. <laughs> it was a joke. That's what's great right. about it. Okay. So I have this one. From astronomy.com. <clears throat> We've talked about some of this. Uh, this, is, this is universe stuff. Alrighty. Hubble. Hence, today's universe expands faster than it did in the past. Ah. The universe is currently expanding 9% faster than the early universe, which is forcing astronomers to reconsider some fundamental aspects of the cosmos. For a while now, astron astronomers have been confronting, confronting a conundrum. Sturly studies of the early universe, looking at the era just after the Big Bang, tell us that the cosmos should be expanding at one speed. But when astronomers actually measure today's universe, they find a far faster rate of expansion. Scientists have known that the universe is expanding for around a century, 
Astronomers like Edwin Hubble first noticed that every distant galaxy they could measure seemed to be moving away from Earth, and the farther they were, the faster they receded. In more recent years, astronomers have measured the expansion rate of today's universe using the Hubble Space Telescope, and mysteriously, the number it found for our current expansion was some 9% off from the expansion rate of the early universe, as measured by the European Space Agency's Planck spacecraft. At the time, astronomers said the odds were something like 1 in 3,000 that the disagreements were a fluke. But in a study released Wednesday, the scientists say they've refined the Hubble measurements, doubling down on the idea that today's universe is expanding faster than it was in the past, and dropping the odds of a, of a mistake to 1 in 100,000. At this point, something is definitely fishy, and astro astronomers need to understand why. <clears throat> so... I thought this was dark energy. Yeah. Like uh, the accelerating expansion. Right. So. Yeah. But, well, that's what I thought too. But this is, I'm not sure if that's what they're talking about here. So okay. it says building, okay, so building the cosmic distance ladder. The Hubble constant is a measure of how fast a galaxy is moving compared to how far away it is. And measuring the speed of a star or galaxy is surprisingly straightforward. The light from any cosmic object moving away from Earth is shifted towards lower frequency, redder colors, just like how an ambulance siren gives off a lower pitch as it's driving away from you. The bigger the shift, the faster the object is moving. But actually measuring the distance to a star or galaxy can be quite tricky. The scientists using Hubble to measure cosmic expansion are following a tradition set down by the pioneers of this field. Astronomers look at Cepheid variables, I think that's how you say that, Cepheid, Cepheid variables, stars that change their brightnesses on rhythmic, predictable timescales to measure distances. It's a discovery we can thank Harvard astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt for. She first discovered that the intrinsic brightness of one of these stars is directly connected to how long it takes to cycle from dim to bright. Since more distant stars appear dimmer, that means astronomers can use the timing of the star's cycle and how bright it appears to measure the star's distance. Edwin Hubble himself used this information to make one of the first measurements of his constant. And today, astronomers like Nobel laureate Adam Rice are using the Hubble telescope to do just the same, but with far greater precision. Rice is the lead researcher on the newly released paper, which has been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal. He led a team called Shoes. <laughs> supernova H0 for the equation of state to pin down the Hubble constant to unprecedented precision. Cepheids are just the first rung on the so-called cosmic distance ladder. Measuring accurate distances to Cepheids yields distances to the closest galaxies where they reside. Measuring the brightness of special type 1A supernova in those galaxies reveals the distances to farther galaxies where the same type of supernova shine. So this is, a, we've talked about this, how they're just, a, there's kind of assumptions that these are all the same. Yeah. Uh, type 1A supernovas, and then there's the main sequence stars, stuff like that. Uh, and so on, building the ladder to, into a ruler to measure the cosmos. But any uncertainty in the first rung of that ladder, ladder propagates into every other step. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So... Rice and his SHOES team used Hubble Space Telescope observations combined with ground-based observations to reduce the uncertainty in the disti distance to Cepheid variables in the nearby Large Magellanic Cloud from 2.5% to 1.3%. So they reduced the uncertainty there. That's not too bad. They found that the earlier measurements of the Hubble constant in the nearby universe were spot on. This came as a surprise to Reese and his team because it confirmed earlier disagreements with the Planck Telescope. That spacecraft, measures, that spacecraft measures fundamentals about the early universe, mapping the cosmic microwave background, and calculating the ratio of dark energy, dark matter, and normal matter. And Rice's measurements do not stand alone, but in line with a host of other measurements from today's universe. Similarly, Planck's numbers are backed up by other measurements of the early universe in the first few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Neither seem likely to change at this point. This is not just two experiments disagreeing, Rice explained in a press release. We are measuring something fundamentally different. One is a measurement of how fast the universe is expanding today as we see it. The other is a prediction based on the physics of the early universe and on measurements of how fast it ought to be expanding. 
If these values don't agree, there becomes a very strong likelihood that we're missing something in the cosmological model that connects the two eras. Yeah. So they look at early, me early universe measurements with the Planck spacecraft, and they figure out all this stuff, and then they project into the future from that. And then when we measure today, And then we measure different. today, there's 9%. They're nine percent off, and so there's something missing there. Yeah. <clears throat> and they think that the early measurements were accurate. Yes, because yeah. they've been tested by multiple different devices right. over. Yeah. So they think the discrepancy is not a mistake. Right. That's cool. Yeah, I like it. It is not clear what the solution is to make the two numbers agree. <laughs> <laughs> And indeed, at this point, it's not clear that they will ever agree. Instead, it's looking more like a true sign that our early universe behaved differently than it does today with regard to expansion. So, what might cause these changes? This is the part where, okay, I'll just, I'll just keep reading it. Uh, dark energy, while still deeply misunderstood, <laughs> no one understands me. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to do a drawing of that. Dark energy all angsty. No one understands me. <laughs> While deeply misunderstood is best described as the energy that causes expansion from the Big Bang's first outward rush to the movement we still see today. While dark energy is part of the standard cosmological model, it could be that it worked in surprising ways, increasing the universe's expansion at some point after the Big Bang. Or Rice suggests that the key might lay in dark radiation, like neutrinos. Now we've got, now we have dark radiation too. <laughs> dark matter, dark energy, and now dark radiation. Neutrinos, particles that travel at nearly the speed of light but barely interact with normal matter. Whatever the resolution, Rice says we will likely need to accept that these two numbers are genuinely different. Now astronomers must focus on seeking a resolution by coming up with better models of our universe. So. <clears throat> But there, like, I know I, I don't fully understand. Like, it, the, the the thing that that I can't remember what the the woman's name was who discovered the uh, the flaring stars, like, or they're light changing at certain frequencies. Oh yeah, the Cepheid variable. Yeah, like I don't fully understand that, but that still seems to be an assumption that okay, you know, here's one that's that's changing at the same rate as this other one. But the light is shifted, more red shifted or something. So it yeah. should be the same because it's the same frequency. Yeah, of star, shifting. Cepheid variables, stars that change their brightnesses on a rhythmic, predictable time scale. Yeah. And so the, 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 the assumption is, is that all these stars that do this are constructed basically the same way. Right. And so they will pulse so they should be if they're if they're pulsing at the same frequency they should have the same frequency of light yeah so then they can look at some and say well the frequency of light's lower yeah therefore it's further away yeah i, I was just thinking like or it's traveling faster away from yeah us. they use the they use the very varying frequency to figure out uh distance but that only works with close galaxies they have to look at the type 1A supernovas to really look at the farther away ones because they... That's the same assumption. Yes. That they're always the same. Right. That's why they call them that. Type 1A supernova. Right. <laughs> this explosion happens the same way every time. In all, in all of the ones that are doing it at this frequency or whatever. Yeah. 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 Which is kind of like assuming that stars in some way are like a stick of dynamite. One stick of TNT is always going to blow up and give you the same energy yield every time, but that's because they were manufactured that way, right? Yeah, that's the part that I have a problem with. And I guess what they're saying is, and I don't know enough of the underlying physics to say this is bullshit, but yeah, you know, they're saying that the underlying physics implies that every star of this size and age and mass is going to burn in this same exact way. But is that true throughout the past? I don't know. Has yeah. the universe changed enough from the beginning to now to make those kinds of stars different? Uh, yeah, and that's the other thing is that if, if it's, you know, 100,000 light years away, the, the light you're seeing is 100,000 light years old. I mean, yeah. 100,000 years old. Right. That's right. So. Yeah. It, and that's, that's another interesting thing. So, like, the expansion is, is uh, accelerating. Yet yeah. the light that they're looking at is ridiculously old. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's like today it's expanding more. I was like, no, but that, <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> that light that you were looking at a hundred years ago or whatever is, is still possibly hundreds of thousands of years old. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, okay, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. The, 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 the two different observations, it doesn't matter how far apart they were, the observations were made. There's a discrepancy in the data. There's a discrepancy in the data of looking at the early universe versus the modern universe, right? So looking at the Planck uh, telescope stuff, which is looking at cosmic microwave background. Yeah. Of the early, that's the early universe. It's right after the Big Bang, right? That's Big Bang light, basically. Yeah. Really, really old yeah. light. Yeah, 13 plus, 13 billion years plus or whatever. Yeah. And then this other stuff is just... And then you're looking at type 1A supernovas in distant are, galaxies. Yeah, that are maybe millions of years old. Right. And then you're looking at the Cepheid variables, which are... Well, those are probably millions of years old. But they're, like, they were talking about Cepheid variables in the Magellanic Cloud, which is going to be... You know, that's, that's the closest galaxy to us. Okay. It's Andromeda. So, uh, still, it's like... Yeah, millions of 200, years million, old. 200 million years old. Hundreds of millions of yeah. years old. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. My, my point was, it's just a stupid point, but mm -hmm. it was just that they're saying the universe today. It's like, right, no, yeah, yeah. You're not looking light at, is yeah. hundreds of millions That's of years right. old. The only universe today thing you're looking at is the sun. <laughs> it's, it's eight and minutes And it's still old. eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, but but I guess when you're talking about 14 billion years versus 200 million, yeah. you know, 200 million is today. Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Cosmologically speaking, that's today. <laughs> but yeah, I just don't, I, I'm not sure. And maybe there's good reasons for them to make all those assumptions. Right, I just, that's, that's what I was saying too. It's like, I don't really understand all the stuff about these specific stars, but it seems like a pretty serious assumption to say yeah. well because i noticed the frequency changes are the same and there's certain attributes that are similar yeah then all of them that are at this frequency are the same right so how many did you find to then assume that anyone you look at after that is going to be the same as the first couple of i remember reading that she found a lot of them like she and she was she figured all this stuff out like she was finding all these different stars and they're all uh, they're pulsing, pulsing at different frequencies and then she figured out that there's some regularity to the frequencies and then there's some that are like these frequencies are the same between these and then there's other ones that are the same but you know what I'm saying there's different sets of, yeah, okay, of yeah. frequency changes and but they're they match each other so the assumption was I, I need to look into it again but the assumption was is that you could time these frequencies of, of changes and and know something about the star and the distance or something like that. Yeah. It seems like wouldn't the pulse also redshift, quote unquote? Because of time dilation? Yeah. So? Hmm. Or am I totally wrong on that? Like the farther away it is, wouldn't it look like it was taking longer to do the full frequency change shift? Or would that not be measurable really? Is it only the frequency of light that changes and not the frequency of change? <laughs> of, yeah. No, I think it I think it would. It seems like it would, yeah. Yeah. So that But, would but that's so minute, right? Yeah. But if it's Because it, you're talking about frequency of light, which is in, in in like tetraseconds or something like that. Yeah. Or no. What am I thinking? That's the length, the wavelength. Anyway. Nanoseconds? Like tiny, 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 tiny? Yeah, tiny increments of time. Yeah. So as you, as you say, lower the frequency of light, the timing of the frequency in terms of time measurement is like still ridiculously fast. Yeah. But the frequency of light is changing noticeably in terms of visibility. Right. So we can measure really tiny changes. Yeah. So, if so it might be the same. You know, they might... It might work yeah, out. Yeah, I'm saying that those two would give you a correlation. Yes. Right? If I you're like, you're right. okay, if I'm making the assumption that all these stars basically pulse the same way, 
And then I'm looking at this particular one that's pulsing, and but I'm looking red at it, and it's red shifting, and then I'm taking its red shift and matching it with the change in its pulse. Yeah. And I'm saying these seem to match up in terms of what I think the distance is on both of them. And that would sort of give you a correlation. To, yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. You just couldn't do that from very far away. Meaning, like, if they're really distant galaxies, you're not going to be able to pick out one star. You just can't do it. Yeah. So you have to look at supernovas. That's why they I look see. at type 1A supernovas, because the supernova will briefly outshine the whole, the, outshine every star in the galaxy. So you can look at the frequency of that and then measure its redshift, but you don't have the corresponding pulse to match that with to see if you're getting the right uh, shift. Hmm. The type 1A supernovas, are they, they supernova on a regular basis? Like a, No, that's what I'm saying. You they're just random. Yeah, star just blows up. Okay. And then that's it. It doesn't do it again. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So that wouldn't even matter. Like you wouldn't be. That's what I mean. Like, unlike with the Cepheid variables. <laughs> Watchers here. <laughs> yeah, better late than never. <laughs> <coughs> That's what I mean. Unlike with the Cepheid variable star with the type 1A supernova, you don't have that second thing right. to check to against yeah. your redshift gotcha. calculations. Right? Yeah. And then, of course, and then you're looking at the early, really early universe. You just don't have, you just don't have, uh, uh, you know, it's a cosmic microwave background. You're looking at expansion. And then you're projecting forward and getting the wrong number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wish I knew more of the math on that. Yeah, that's a difficult subject to rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. Because there's so much math. Yeah. But I mean, like, you just you just have to assume like they're probably taking into account all the stuff, anything that I can think right. of. They're probably yeah. thinking of that, <laughs> that's and then right. they're probably and they're still getting it wrong. Right, the, the number's coming up wrong. Yeah. Yeah. But I do have questions about that. Like, how do you start out with the cosmic microwave background and then project expansion rates into the future from that? You're basically you're modeling the early universe, and then from once you've got your model, and you're like, okay, this matches kind of like what we see. Now let's project it into the future and let's see if it matches something we can falsify. You know, yeah, something we can test. Let's mo use that same model and project it all the way into the quote unquote present, and then look out there and see what we get. And yeah. it doesn't match up. So either their models of the early universe are wrong, or they're missing something in the intervening time period, which is what that article was saying. Yeah, they don't mention that the models of the, their models of the early universe might be wrong. Which oh, is, I thought they did. No, he just said that there is something in the intervening oh, okay. time period. Maybe maybe they did say that. Yeah. How's it going, Watcher? How you doing today? <laughs> what time we got here? Oh, uh, we're up. Break. We're up. Yeah, break we're time. Up. Yeah, way over. Oh. Happy to be here finally. All yeah. right, <clears throat> doing the introduction at the watcher of the watcher at the end of the second segment. Yeah, can you say uh, elongated reptilian legless something? <laughs> elongated reptilian legless something. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <in>. snakes. <laughs> Welcome back, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Cracking open some beers for the second half of the show. Ah. So, a tradition. <laughs> it is. It is. Crack open some beers with us. Light your pipes. <laughs> and let's talk about some ancient Americans. This is kind of the stuff we were getting into last episode with the Clovis. So that whole thing Kyle read with the, about the Anzic One skeleton sent me down a rabbit hole of um, stuff. And so I want to read this article. Uh, this is called Ancient DNA Links Native Americans with Europe. Where did the first Americans come from? Most Oh, this is from SOT.net, S-O-T-T.net. Uh, 
Most researchers agree that Paleo-Americans moved across the Bering Land Bridge from Asia sometime before 15,000 years ago, suggesting roots in East Asia. But just where the source populations arose has long been a mystery. Now comes a surprising twist from the complete nuclear genome of a Siberian boy who died 24,000 years ago. The oldest complete genome of a modern human sequenced to date, his DNA shows close ties to those of today's Native Americans. Yet, he apparently descended not from East Asians, but from people who had lived in Europe or Western Asia. <laughs> Europe or Western Asia. Right. Same thing? Yeah. Or Eastern, are they two different Eastern places? Eastern Europe, yeah. East Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Asia. Okay. Areas, areas similar, yeah. So the findings suggest that about a third of the ancestry of today's Native Americans can be traced to Western Eurasia, with the other two-thirds coming from Eastern Asia, according to a talk at a meeting uh, by ancient DNA expert Eske Willersev of the University of Copenhagen. Willerslev, I think is how it says. Uh, it also implies that traces of European ancestry previously detected in, modern, detected in modern Native Americans do not come solely from mixing with European colonists, as most scientists had assumed, but have much deeper roots. So, finding European ancestry in modern Native Americans, they all just assumed that it was from mixing with colonists. They just, you know, just assumed it. Because it doesn't fit the cross from Siberia story. Okay. The Beringia land bridge. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So basically, uh, well, I'll keep reading here and then we'll go into it. Okay. So I'm still processing, quote, I'm still processing that Native Americans are one third European, says geneticist Con Connie Mulligan of the University of Florida. It is jaw dropping. At the very least, says geneticist Dennis O'Rourke of the University of Utah, this is going to stimulate a lot of discussion. Researchers have been trying to parse the origins of the first Americans for decades. Most agree that people moved across Beringia via a, last, a vast ice land bridge and began spreading through the Americas, reaching Chile by 14,500 years ago. But the, but the origins of the source populations are not clear, and some archaeologists have even suggested that ancient Europeans crossing the Atlantic were part of the mix. And that's the Salutrian hypothesis. Others have contended that early skeletons found in the Americas, such as the 9,000-year-old Kennewick Man, show some European features. In his talk, Willerslev argued that the ancient genome, quote, can actually explain a lot of these inconsistencies, unquote, by offering glimpses, glimpses of prehistoric populations before more recent migrations and other demographic events blurred the picture. The genome comes from the upper right arm bone of a boy aged about four years who lived by Siberia's Belaya River. Those who buried him adorned his grave with flint tools, pendants, a bead necklace, and a sprinkling of ochre. So we got similarities ah. here. In the 1920s, Russian archaeologists discovered the burial and other artifacts near a village called Malta. Interesting. <laughs> which gave the celebrated site its name. Willer Slev and co-author Kelly Graff of Texas A&M University and College Station traveled to the State uh, Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, where the boys' remains are housed and took a bone sample. Willer Slev reported that the team, the team was able to sequence the boys' genome and also to radiocarbon date the bone. The team then used a variety of statistical methods to compare the genome with that of living populations. They found that a portion of the boy's genome is shared only by today's Native Americans and no other groups, showing a close relationship. Yet the child's Y chromosome belongs to a genetic group called Y haplogroup R and its mitochondrial DNA to haplogroup U. Today, those haplogroups are found almost exclusively in people living in Europe and regions of Asia west of the Altai Mountains, which are near the borders of Russia, China, and Mongolia. One expected relationship was missing from the picture. The boy's genome showed no connection to modern East Asians. DNA studies of living people strongly suggest that East Asians, perhaps Siberians, Chinese, or Japanese, make up the major part of Native American ancestors. So, how could the boy be related to living Native Americans, but not to East Asians? This was kind of puzzling at first, Willerslev told the meeting. But... There seemed little doubt that the finding was correct, he said, because nearly all Native Americans from North and South America were equally related to the Malta child, indicating that he represented very deep Native American roots. Hmm. 
the team proposes a relatively simple scenario. Before 24,000 years ago, the ancestors of Native Americans and the ancestors of today's East Asians split into distinct groups. The Malta child represents a population of Native American ancestors who moved into Siberia, probably from Europe or West Asia. Then, sometime after the Malta boy died, this population mixed with East Asians. The new admixed population eventually made its way to the Americas. Exactly when and where the admixture happened is not clear, Willislev said. But the deep roots in Europe or West Asia could help, could help explain features of some Paleo-American skeletons and of Native American DNA today. The West Eurasian genetic signatures that we very often find in today's Native Americans don't all come from post-colonial admixture, Willerslev said in his talk. Some of them are very, very ancient. The talk sparked lively exchange, and not everyone was ready to buy the team's scenario, at least until they can read the full paper, which is in press at nature. This is a lot to hang on one skeleton, Mulligan says. <laughs> but they do it with Anzik. so many others. Yeah. Witherslev said during yeah it, it's fine to hang it on one skeleton as long as it fits your it fits your model yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Witherslev said during the discussion that his group is now uh, trying to sequence the genomes of skeletons further west. It's right there. Ah, uh, I'm signaling for the lighter. <laughs> the <laughs> only, while he's reading the only lighter we have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I left that lighter far to the east. <laughs> <laughs> the new findings are consistent with a report published in Genetics last year, and almost entirely ignored at the time, that used modern DNA to conclude that Native Americans have significant and ancient ties to Europeans. Our group is very excited to see this, says Alexandra Kim, who works with geneticist David Reich at Harvard Medical School in Boston and represented the group at the meeting. Reich's team found that populations they identified as Native American ancestors in Asia apparently also contributed genes to populations in Northern Europe. Thus, both studies suggest a source population in Asia whose genes made their way east all the way to the Americas and west all the way to Europe. Malta might be a missing link, a representative of the Asian population that admixed both into Europeans and Native Americans, Reich says. If so, he adds, it shows the value of ancient DNA in peeling back history and resolving mysteries that are difficult to solve using only present day samples. That's really cool. Yeah. So I found this really fascinating in conjunction with what you read about Anzic last time and how it only matches. It doesn't match North American and Native Americans. Right. And it only matches people. So he can't South. be, could, could Anzic be a descendant of, what did they name this? Boy? Um, I can't remember. The Malta child. Okay. I may be saying that wrong. It's got an apostrophe in it somewhere. But uh, you see what I'm saying? Can there be a connection? I'm not sure how this works. He's, he is a, an ancestor. Well, obviously not him, but his genes are ancestral genes to both the North and South American natives. But this one that they found, the, the Anzic one, is not related to the North American yeah. natives. Yeah. So is that a is he a common ancestor of Anzic one? Uh, Can that be possible? You no. see what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't. Think he can't so. be. No. Which is really weird. Yeah, but what's interesting about this? The date, twenty four thousand years ago. That is. That matches the timeline of the existence of the Salutrian culture. No, this does not mean you're eligible for any scholarships, Watcher. <laughs> <laughs> See why? This is why we don't give him a mic, <laughs> folks. <laughs> Very good reason for the Watcher to be silent. <laughs> uh Okay, so what was I? What was I? Okay, yeah, the 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 dating here on this child, <clears throat> uh, twenty four thousand years ago. That is the timeline of the Salutrians, and so we were talked about the Salutrian hypothesis last week. Yeah. Okay. And you looked into that further. Yeah. So let me pull up Scriptartopedia. Cool. Salutrian hypothesis. First giant word says wrong. 
No, joking. <laughs> the Salutrian hypothesis on the peopling of the Americas claims that the earliest human migration to the Americas took place from Europe during the last glacial maximum. This hypothesis contrasts with the mainstream view that the North American continent was first reached after the glass glacial maximum by people from North Asia, either by the Bering Land Bridge or by maritime travel along the Pacific coast, or both. According to the Salutrian hypothesis, people of the Salutrian culture, 21 to 17,000 years ago, migrated to North America by boat along the pack ice of the North Atlantic Ocean. So during the LGM, the North Atlantic had ice coming far south. And uh, what they're saying, I'm not sure this is right, because I thought they were island hoppers. Yeah. But this is saying that they moved along the, the ice. On the, foot? No, that they traveled by boat, yeah. Okay, below the ice. Yeah. Well, you know, the ice is a form of an island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sort of a very dangerous one. <laughs> they brought their methods of making stone tools with them and provided the basis for the later Clovis technology that spread throughout North America. The hypothesis is based on similarities between European Salutrian and Clovis lithic technologies. Supporters of the Salutrian hypothesis refer to recent archaeological finds such as, such as those at Cactus Hill in Virginia, Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania, and Miles Point in Maryland as evidence of a transitional phase between Salutrian lithic technology and what later became Clovis tech. Originally proposed in the 1970s, the theory has received some support in the 2010s, notably by Dennis Stanford of the Smithsonian Institution and Bruce Bradley of the University of Exeter. However, according to David Meltzer, few, if any, archaeologists, or for that matter, geneticists, linguists, or physical anthropologists take seriously the idea of a Salutrian colonization of America. Unquote. Great. No one cares. <laughs> so this is the... I don't care how many people take it seriously. What I care is, is does it work? This is the part of, in Graham's book, he sort of belittles uh, an idea without going into any detail about the mound builders in America. And like, and I didn't get this at first. I thought he was talking about the giants. Like mm -hmm. the idea that there might have been giants that lived here. Yeah. Um, the, but he said, you know, um, to paraphrase, he's like, you know, the ridiculous hypothesis that Caucasians came across and <laughs> built all these mounds because the natives obviously couldn't do it. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? And, you know, I was like, okay, I've never heard that. Yeah. That anyone... But I can imagine, you know, in, in reading American history, you know, there were obviously, like, uh, some people of the times were prejudiced against the quote-unquote savages, they called them, you know. Yeah. And, they, and, and I can see that maybe... Seeing some of the great earthworks, they might have been like, oh, these savages couldn't have built this, blah, blah, right. blah. And, but I've never heard that in, in terms of a modern theory about the mound builder culture. But he mentions that in his book. Yeah. Like, it's a, like it, this is a prevailing theory or a, an alternative theory that he's just like completely ridiculing and casting off, right? Yeah. And I was just like, is he talking about the giants? Like, uh, what, what is this? Right, because they're supposed to be the red-haired. yeah. Caucasians, but they're obviously not white people. They're enormous. They're like a totally yeah. different race, right? But the, so the <laughs> Salutrian hypothesis, the idea is that some Europeans came over here first. Yeah, and and that's why it's it's been and sort of ridiculed. Europeans from twenty four to seventeen thousand years, years ago, ago, they're not. The they're same, not Europeans, right? As we think of them today, <laughs> right? It's just not the same. So the idea that so so, but it, but that's. What's happening, right? With what is that? What Graham is talking about is what probably I'm he's talking about. That yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if that's what because he didn't about. really say. Maybe maybe he did. Maybe I need to read it. So again. The, the like this says it was first proposed in the 1970s. Okay. Yeah. It was. It supposedly has been picked, and I, I don't know this because I haven't looked into it. I'm sure it's possible that it was. That has been one misconstrued and two picked up by people for other reasons. Yeah. Okay. So, like, no one, including the original proposers of it, or the people who are talking about it today, are saying anything about race. Yeah. Okay. Because when you're talking about the, quote-unquote, Europeans, people who lived in the Pyrenees, the Salutrians are from the Pyrenees region of France. Like, the, that's where the Basque live now, the mountains. Okay. Mountain range, the Pyrenees, right? <clears throat> so, they made these beautiful clover... Uh, these leaf-shaped tools, 
the Salutrians did. And when you look at those and their quote unquote lithic technologies, their stone tech, and you look at the Salutrian points and then you look at Clovis points, you see like a clear similarity. Yeah. They're not exactly the same. But you can but see they're using like, similar technologies. Yeah, and and so them. so the the interesting thing about the Salutrians is that unlike the people before them and the people after, they were making these points. Do they have like skeletal remains that they've? Uh, yeah, I don't know of the Salutrians, or, or is it just their 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 yeah their, their tools their that tools. they're analyzing and calling? Yeah, I don't them. I don't know about that because that's that's common, right? You find a bunch of tools that are similar, and then you name. The people that made those tools after, the like, tool, like yeah. the Clovis culture is named after like a town. Yeah, Clovis, New Clovis, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, right. But the people have never really been. You know, the Anzic One is the only person ever found that has been, you know, claimed to be part of the Clovis, Clovis culture, and that's because they were found. They're dated at the right time and found associated with Clovis points. Right. But they may not. It may not be a Clovis person. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> but. The, so the thing about the Salutrians is that the people before them and the people after them did not make these tools. Yeah. Okay. And like the 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 one of the things that they were doing was the thinning. So this is important when you're making yeah. these tools. They made them real thin. And the people before and after didn't do that. They you know they had a they their points were not thinned down like that. Right. And the other interesting thing about the Salutrians is that is that it almost looked like they. they a lot of their points don't have signs of usage, almost like it was an art form for them. Like, look how thin I can make this freaking blade, mm -hmm. you know? And then it would break, and you're like, well, whew, you toss it. But So the idea is, is that why do those points look so similar to Clovis points? Yeah. And it isn't even necessarily that the peoples are the same. Mm -hmm. It's that the technology was transferred somehow. But since the Salutrians are found in the, the Salutrian tools, at least, and thus quote, supposedly the people were found in the Pyrenees in France, that's Europe. And so they were saying, well, maybe they came across the Atlantic. And since the timeline that they're, those points are dated to is, you know, the lat during the LGM, when, when, the, when the ice was at its maximum extent, that means the sea levels were at their lowest extent mm -hmm. and the, you know. Who so, knows? So the idea was, did they island hop across the Atlantic and end up in the Americas and spread across that way? And not necessarily even spread genetically, but just spread the tool technology. But it, it, in pretty much every case, when a people are spreading, like they're moving across like vast areas of land, you'll find a genetic trail. Yeah. You know, like the... Yeah. So it's weird that there's no there's no genetic trail basically. Yeah. For the movement. Like how did they get here and then go all the way down to South America without creating any type of Well, we don't have any remains. Yeah. So the genetic trail is lacking because we don't have any genes. Right. Yeah, as far as I know, there's no Salutrian Skeletons, maybe there are. I'll have to look into that. But the other thing is that there's one Clovis, like that you read about last time, the yeah. Anzic, and it's it doesn't match what they thought it was going to match either. Right. To me, what that skeleton was saying genetically was that today's Native Americans do not have as their ancestors the Clovis people. Right. That's as simple as you can say it. Clovis are not the ancestors of today's modern Native Americans. Yeah. Whatever that means. Right. Or even the uh like the early, mid and late archaic natives. What what? Like the Anzic one didn't have any relationship to any of the of the remains of any of the Yeah. Right. You know. Right. Native so Americans the Clovis people in North America were wiped out. Right. And today's modern Native Americans came from another people who came by came over later is what yeah. that seems like to me. <clears throat> so that's why I'm saying maybe both uh, hypotheses are correct. Yeah. Like Beringia, they 
they did come across that, but it was at a different time. Right. So here's the problem with the Clovis. And different people. The problem with the Clovis people coming across the Beringia is that there aren't any Clovis tools found in Siberia. Yeah. <laughs> now that just that could mean that we just haven't found them yet. Right. But there are plenty of lithics from Siberia. There just there just aren't any Clovis. Yeah. So maybe they are yet to be found. But, but the that's fact- that's why the Salutrians have such similar technology. It's a good right. It's a good bet that there's a connection there. Yeah. So it's weird that if 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 Antic One is a Clovis person, right? But he's not related to any of today's. Native American populations genetically. But he is related to people in South, South and Central America genetically. Is an ancestor of those people. Okay. <clears throat> the question is, is, so where did he come from? If now you have this, this article I just read, there's a skeleton of a boy who is in Siberia, 24,000 years old. So that's in the timeline of the Salutrians from Europe. Who has DNA from Europe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and is related to modern Native Americans. Huh. I, I need to see a graphic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. That's why it's weird, right? <laughs> so you have a skeleton whose dating time period matches the time of the Salutrians. They're in the LGM period, right? Yeah. <clears throat> From Siberia. That has DNA that matches people from Europe and Asia. So it's both. Okay. That person is an ancestor of today's native North American natives. But the Anzig skeleton is not an ancestor of today's North American natives. Yeah. So to me, that just paints a complex picture, right? It's just complicated. Yeah. The, 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 I'm sure people came across from Siberia into the United States and into North America, basically, and then went down to South America. People probably came the other way, too. And people probably arrived in South America and were going up north. Yeah. It's just complicated. The, in other words, the Bering Land Bridge theory is probably right, but, but it's, it's not, not the, the whole story. One. Yeah, Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But yeah, I wish there was more information on it. It's, it's really strange, you know, and, and, and bec- this is the other thing. Because we're talking about a single skeleton here and a partial skeleton there, it just isn't cl- conclusive. Right. It's giving us, like, we're, we're getting, like, a tiny fragment of information on a very complicated series of migrations and movements. And it just isn't enough to paint a complete picture. But there are people who have theories that are... The complete picture. And so they're like, this one agrees with our theory. And they're like, no, that one agrees with our theory. And it's just like, well. Yeah, I see what you're saying. <clears throat> but I found all this to be very fascinating. Um, and this is this specifically that it's like, <laughs> it doesn't, none of it matches up to what's supposed to be going right. on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they. Classic. Yeah. Uh But this idea that this person is, uh, let's see if I can find this. Um, they're looking at this kid as being a, the, the one found in Siberia, this child found in Siberia, as being an ancestor of people who ended up in Europe. See what I'm saying? So it matches with genomes from Europe, but they're saying that, like, that's, this kid is an ancestor of those people. Okay. Because we're talking about the timeline again. So if you end up with people in Siberia and they end up in – and people that are descendants of that genome end up in Europe and also end up in North America. And then those people come over later. I don't know. You know, it's, it's a complicated yeah. picture. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I found this like – so we, we talked about this during the, um, during the week. About that skeleton, like the strangeness of this, the, how they were trying to point out that it was a child using sutures. Yeah. And you were like, okay, there's a collarbone and some ribs, right? And even if they're just fragmented, if there's enough to where you can get, you know, once you figure out, okay, this is part of a rib bone, 
then you can basically estimate the size of the rib bone based on that piece. Yeah. And the fact that they were using skull suture information to try to say, look, this is probably probably means that it was a child between one and, you know, it was like around one a, and a two. Year, one and two. But not mentioning the sizes of bones. Yeah, I thought that was strange. So I, so we talked about how, like, could it have been because the size was abnormal, either one way or the other. Yeah. You know. It could be either way. Like, it was abnormally large, but the sutures weren't closed. So they were like, uh, uh, it's a child. Yeah, it seems to be a child <laughs> because the skull sutures aren't totally closed. But the bones are big. Yeah. It just uh, you pointed out when reading that you were like, look, why don't they? You know, you got part of a clavicle, a collarbone here. Like, why aren't they saying, well, you know, this is it was tiny, like a one year old yeah. clavicle is going to be a little bitty thing, and they don't ever mention that. Yep. The other thing was is it it could be like it could have been a very small person, right? That they originally estimated to be one to two years old. Yeah. Because of the size of the bones. And then they're trying to say, well, <laughs> I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, because like one of the things with a very small person that's an adult is that you'll see like adult, other adult markers that tells you like, well, even though this person is very small, it's an adult. Yeah. What I thought was strange was that they, they used that that suture that's in the middle of the of the frontal lobe yeah to say that it was still because it was still open corroborates the idea that it was a 1 to 2 year old right right but there's a condition that can result in that suture not ever completely sealing up yeah all the way into adulthood uh, I just read about that. Not, I don't know. It was just weird. Uh, I have to look that up, that suture. But anyway, we need to take a break. Yep. So uh, we'll come back for the last segment. and uh, Yeah, might be a short segment, but yeah, we'll come back for the last segment. All right, snacks! Welcome back, folks. I looked this up because I can't even, it's hard for me to remember the exact arguments we were making about these bones. Uh, but basically, uh, we got the watcher here with us this time, so I wanted to have this discussion with him. So in the Wikipedia page on Anzic 1, under osteological findings, it says Anzic 1's skeletal remains included 28 cranial fragments, the left clavicle, and several ribs. These bones were discovered in highly fragmented states. However, partial reconstruction of the crania allowed for age estimation, investigation of basic health indicators, and some information about cultural practices. Originally, investigators thought the left clavicle showed evidence of cremation, but further analysis revealed that the discoloration was the result of groundwater staining and not fire, Additionally, all of Anzic 1's remains were stained with ochre, which masks the natural color of the infant's bones. Then it goes into age estimation. At the age of death an in of an individual, the age of death of an individual can be determined from several skeletal markers, including cranial suture closure, tooth eruption rates, rates of epiphyseal fusion along on long bones, and others. Cranial bones fuse together along suture lines throughout the life of every human and can be used to estimate the age at death of human remains. The small size and lack of suture closure of Anzic 1's crania revealed that the individual was one to two years old. Small size. The metopic yeah. suture is also present in the frontal bone of Anzic 1. This suture is, is present in most human infants but closes well before adulthood. The presence of a frontal suture in Anzic 1's remains corroborates the age estimation of one to two years. So when I looked up the... Metopic suture, 
pull that up. This is what I found to be strange. The, uh, well, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. The frontal suture is a fibrous joint that divides the two halves of the frontal bone of the skull in infants and children. Typically, it completely fuses between three and nine months of age, with the two halves of the frontal bone being fused together. It is also called the metopic suture, so that's the one. Now, there is a condition where that suture doesn't close up. Uh, and then there's another condition. If the suture is not present at birth because both frontal bones have fused, that is called craniosynostosis. Synostosis, yeah. It will cause a keel-shaped deformity of the skull called trigonocephaly. So, obviously, you didn't have that. But... Three to nine months. Yeah, three to nine months. So how does that corroborate one to two years old? <laughs> I, I guess I, – I, mean, I know it says it typically it typically completely fuses between three and nine months. But already you have – what we were questioning was if they have a clavicle and multiple ribs, how can they not estimate the age based on the size of these bones? Well, so I've got several questions. I mean if I'm being honest, I – I don't know how to read the bones. Um, <laughs> You're not. A I'm witch sure doctor? there's a methodology to this, but based on what is what you read, there's nowhere near enough things to piece together. Like in the article, it references these are ways that you can make predictions from bones. The bones we had are none of those things. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did say suture closure on suture lines, and they and they had skull fragments. Right. So they had what? Twenty eight bones. Twenty eight right, skull fragments. fragments. Twenty eight skull fragments. There's twenty two bones in your skull. Oh. So, <laughs> like, if you have twenty eight fragments, you have maybe at best, like, depending on the size of your fragments, you got six seven bones from the skull yeah so you've got and, little you've got little pieces we don't know how big the pieces were right <clears throat> this and is then, highly fragmented I yeah mean, that so. makes me think of like you know i'm thinking of pieces that are like the size of a tooth you know yeah right um and then furthermore how do you know the suture's not there maybe you're just missing those pieces like what are you basing that on yeah so my to my, make that conclusion well, well they were saying that the, that the sutures were were open like like that the sutures hadn't complete based on this looking at the suture closure that they were estimating one to two years of age but the weird thing is is they don't they say that the that the frontal what is it called uh metopic, metopic suture, suture corroborated the age estimation yeah as though they and didn't it, have any of the other sutures to look at right yeah, that's what it sounded like to me. So the came, the the original age estimation came before the suture was included in to corroborate the right. age estimation. You see what I'm saying? Like they were making the age estimation on the size of the bones, which they didn't mention in the story. Anything about the size of yeah, the bones. Yeah, there was only that one brief mention, the small size of the skull is it, it said. And the suture rate of and the amount of suture closure corroborates the one to two years of age okay but they basically are looking at the size it sounded to me like what they're saying is that's that, right yeah. the small size and lack of suture closure of anzic one's crania revealed that the individual was one to two years old the metopic suture is also present which corroborates the age estimation which i'm saying like how does that corroborate the age estimation if it's supposed to be three to nine months yeah so it's like it's I a very large baby <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we were like, maybe it was a giant. Yeah. I think what they're saying there is that because it's present, it means he's older than three to nine months, which, congratulations. Like, <laughs> you've, you've stated that it's, you know, if he lives to 80, like you've 98% of his lifespan, you've managed to knock out there. So you're pretty <laughs> accurate. Well, the, the, the suture was present. Does that mean it's... it's because the suture clo f completely fuses together and is no longer present after three to nine months. Right. So the, the, the suture was present. And Sounds like it's open? Yeah, basically. it's still there. 
Well, they call it a suture even after it's closed. Right. I think the suture is the, the closed portion. Um, so I think what that meant was oh. that the, I think what that means is that, that the suture is present in the sample. In other words, part of that they were able to see part of that suture in the bones that they've got. They're saying, yeah, that's what they're saying. The metopic suture is also present in the frontal bone of Anzic one. <laughs> Okay. This suture is present in most human infants, but closes well before adulthood. Okay. Yeah. So they are implying they're that saying it's that it's a, it's still it's still present because after three to nine months, it completely fuses together, so it's no longer present. Yeah. So what they're saying is this thing that's supposed to close up after three to nine months corroborates their age estimation of one to two years, <laughs> which is what confused right. me. Yeah. And the age estimation is based on size, so it's just like a, lar- get, yeah. a large baby. That's what I was thinking. Like, it's a three-month-old that's the size of a two-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Baby nip. Possibly. <laughs> what do you say? Um, Not enough data? So, <laughs> yeah, definitely. But there is something interesting, another uh, condition that comes from uh, metopic suture irregularity is called uh, metopic craniosynostosis which uh, causes the formation of elongated heads. Hmm. Just just saying. That's interesting. And they were also saying, they also checked it for, what do they call it? Cultural cranial modification or something like that. (laughs) Something like that. Yeah, they gave it this ridiculous name that basically meant long heads. Uh, And they were saying that no, so they checked to see if there was any cranial modification done on this infant, and they they detected no cranial modification. That's right. By on per, like purposeful, yeah, modification, right. So that was interesting to me too because I started to wonder like why did they check for that? Because did it did it seem to have a long head? Yeah, did it exhibit uh, you know yeah certain aspects of like you know very mathematically inclined calculating <laughs> yeah uh, emotionless <laughs> beings <laughs> that run banks. <laughs> Anyway, that was it. So, yeah, that it's whole very strange. There's no pictures of the site. We couldn't find any. Uh, yeah, I lo- stratigraphy. That's right. Uh, I, I looked for images of the of the of the skeleton. Couldn't find any. Uh, not even any drawings of the dig or the site. Uh, you you said you found one image from a distance of the collapsed shelter. It just was a hillside. Yeah, I mean, it didn't look. So, uh, and then of course it was reburied. So, no further science can be done on it. Yeah, my uh, my biggest takeaway from that is that almost all of the things that they referenced in terms of determining age are uh, entirely relative. Like if you found a pygmy from, you know southern africa and you're going off the length of his bone and striation of his long bones versus a let's go six foot five viking Uh uh-huh you get completely different ages right yeah height are different it's all relative so to even make that kind of implication to a twenty thousand something we don't know what their average height was we don't know what the mineral structure of their bones was like based on dietary intake like we have no way of making a reference to our modern Thank stature you. situation. That was my question too. It's like if this is the only specimen, of I feel quote, bad calling it a specimen. Yeah, the only human remains remains yeah. of of, a, of an entire culture that we have ever found. How can we make assumptions based on their suture closure? We don't know what their suture closure rates were. Also true. I guess the assumption is is that all humans, regardless of race, uh have this similar suture closure. But he pointed out, you know, he's right about the size. Well, the, but the, but the long bone fusion rates. Yeah. You're probably right. called. Yeah. Are, are different, right? Is that what you're saying too? Well, what I'm saying is that just, you have no frame of reference. Okay. It would be exactly. like, you know, you wake up one day on a foreign planet and you look and see that the sun's rising in the East and you're like, Oh, well, it's about the size of, you know, Helios or soul in the Earth system. You don't know that. Just because it came up in the East? No. You have no way of knowing that. And it's just, it frustrates me. 
Right. So no frame of reference because this is the only remains found. Exactly. And, you know, they, they, they're associating with Clovis because of the dating plus the artifacts, right? So it was found in context with a bunch of Clovis artifacts. And then when they dated it, they got the date range that matches what they think the Clovis people, you know, like 13,000 13, years ago or something like that. So, yeah, the, the infant was also related to persons from Siberia and Central Asia. So, hmm. so maybe it is has some relation to um, the Malta kid. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't mention any relation to Europe, which is if he was related to that kid, he should have that in, in his DNA in his DNA as well. Yeah. The you haplogroup stuff. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, know. and the uh, the the haplogroups themselves, the water starts to get muddy the further back you go. Um, because each time they find a new set of remains, they're like, "Oh, well, this haplogroup is is over in." let's see, uh, Mexico, and we found them in Australia. Well, that can't be right. So they make a new haplogroup for that? <laughs> well, it, it's not so much that. It's just the more that they do it, the more they realize that these haplogroups are scattered over the entire face of the planet. Oh, okay. So maybe they're like not they, a good measuring tool. Or at le least not a good measuring tool of what regional area someone is descendant from. Okay. Uh, because, of course, they you know, least advanced butt flap. Nobody had boats and could go anywhere else. Right. It seems to me like the arguments against like some, like what you said, if there was, you know, if there was a haplogroup that they were looking at in Mexico that was somehow related to Australia, that they would just, that, that, that because that doesn't fit the theory, they would be like, no, something's wrong here. Right. Well, it, and it seems like the way that what's been happening is they just, because they have this long timeline, Right. Like over four million years, human ancestors came up out of Africa and then branched out all over the world. Like, oh, well, if there's some in Australia and some in Mexico, then that just means there was this 180,000 year gap where the ocean levels adjusted and they just kind of kept walking until they got there. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay, if I could move the goalposts anywhere I want, I could make anything true too. Yeah. <laughs> <Not impressive. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. This this story that I read earlier uh, was basically saying this Siberian kid, the the remains of this Siberian child, matched up with uh, North American Native Americans, but also had, you know, also matched up with Europeans. Okay, but it's ancient Europeans. This is twenty four thousand years ago. But this Ansic one skeleton, the one that we're talking about with the sutures and stuff does not match any North American natives, but does match people from South America. Yeah. And Siberia. <laughs> Which the Siberians are thought to be the ancestors of the North American Native Americans. So they're like, obviously, this proves the Beringia land bridge. Yeah, hypothesis. exactly. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> uh. So the 24,000-year-old skeleton in Siberia is at least in part the ancestors of North American natives. But the 13 or 14,000 year old skeleton that is supposed to be the Clovis person is not a native or is not an ancestor of North American natives. That's yeah. weird. That is weird. That they, uh, is also, they also don't have him defined as a descendant within that group either. It's like there's this bubble around the Clovis. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It it may, it sort of isolates the Clovis from from the North American natives and this Siberian person, right? And that's why I'm talking about the Salutrian thing, right? The Salutrian hypothesis is basically saying that maybe that, and, and this is this is not so much genetic. It, it isn't genetic at all, actually. The Salutrian hypothesis is not based on any genetics at all. It's based on tool types. Yeah. So it's a totally different kind of hypothesis. Okay. And like I listened to um, Seven Ages Audio Journal. We, we both listened to this podcast where one of the guys that is, uh, he's an archaeologist. He also is a 
he's a, he is a professional level napper in terms in terms of like in other words he can make flint tools and he's really really good at it. So when you have an archaeologist who has also taken the time, the years and years and years of practice to learn how to nap, so that he can then look at lithic tools and see that the Bruce the, Bradley is his name. Bruce Bradley, PhD. Yeah, so he can look at these tools and not just identify them by by sort of shape and general appearance, but also like a like he can see the 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 uh, the styles of napping, you know, and the different kinds of uh, skills that it took to do it. So he he basically is for this. He's like, look, the Salutrian thing is basically we're looking at Salutrian tools from the Pyrenees and the Clovis tools of North America and saying that in terms of the way they are made, there is a lot of similarities that don't match up with other peoples from around those same time periods. Yeah. So what they're the Salutrian hypothesis that they are pushing it's not about genetics. It's more about how it's more about saying there's a connection between these tools and these tools. Yeah. Technological connection. Right. Which is not a the same thing as as DNA. Yeah, cuz it can be passed on without right. transferring DNA. Right. It can DNA. cross cultures. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it it's a much more reasonable methodology because as we've seen in like even the last 2-3 years, the DNA modeling has become very problematic for the standard model story. Yeah. And if you have hard evidence, because even if you were going off of these remains that they found and they've tested, right, you figure the population of the world at that time could be anything, but let's say it's 5 million. You have tested 10 corpses and are telling me about the progression of their entire history. Are, are, you, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. It's, like it, it, it doesn't work, but if you have tools all over the place in this one sediment layer, you could make some pretty reasonable um, assumptions there. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot more tools than there are remains. For sure. So the idea that there are tool matches is a lot more solid than there than than th these like tenuous DNA links that don't make any yeah. sense yet. So yeah, exactly. All right. Well, we're coming up on time here. So this is a uh, thanks, Watcher. Yeah, thanks, Watcher. This is this is why we do this podcast, folks. Like none of us, none of us know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> none of this was planned out. We sat down and we're like, "What the fuck's going on here?" And we just had a conversation about it. So that's why that's what I love about doing this podcast. Yeah, definitely gonna keep looking into that one. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Before we close out here, we had a one-up box that I we forgot to open at the beginning uh, of the show, right. so we're going to do that now. Here, I'll do it. All right, go for it. I won't cut myself. Okay, yeah. Oh! I'm sh <laughs> <laughs> this is another perfect cube one-up box from Brandon. Yeah. History shift. We got to get the. I got to get the sound bite for that. Oh yeah. Okay. Note. Ooh. Ooh. Dear Russ and Kyle, I am sending you a true mystery I found while out hiking. A piece of the mystery black mass. Take a look. Love to hear your thoughts. So far, the local forest service, local college, and a retired geologist are stumped. Theories range from a fulgurite to who knows. It is very hard, won't burn or melt. However, it can dissolve in water. WTF is this. <laughs> the main piece is the size of a football. No burns anywhere in the area. Good luck. Stacks! <laughs> History shift. That is really strange. That is. Wow. Look at me. <laughs> Kyle's doing Man, the smell I'm, test. <laughs> no, no smell. Checking for copper light. <laughs> Oh man, this is yeah. It looks like a it looks like a burnt piece of tar or something. It's all yeah. bubbly, jet black creosote. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. It does look like a bitumen. piece of tar. Bitumen. <laughs> He's gonna try to burn it. <laughs> Not in here. <laughs> yeah. Once it finally does catch on fire, it, it will, will never, never go stop. Out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is this is weird looking. It does look like a piece of tar, but you would think that the the Forest Service and college and geologists would know what 
know what that was. Can't they like shoot it with a laser and just tell you what it's made of? Get you the yeah. It's kind of sticky. Is it? No. <laughs> it will dissolve in water. That's strange. That is weird. It's some kind of salt. Yeah. Black salts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Put that with. Thanks, the, buddy. Put that with, the, with, cool with the pyramid. There's a piece of grass stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah, that is wild, man. I don't know what that is. We'll figure it out. All right. You can get a hold of us at brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. Uh, also, visit the website, uh, brothersoftheserpent.com. Check out the... Oh. <laughs> Check it, move. That's right. Check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com. Comment there. Check out the Encyclopedia and the glossary for all the terms, places, things, and other stuff we talk about here and all the words we've made up. Follow us on Twitter at... Snake Bros with no vowels. S N K B R S. Share the shows anywhere you can. That always helps us. And donate to the pyramid scheme. That's right. Send us straight to pyramids. Thanks to everybody who has donated. Also, you can donate on uh, Patreon. That's right. So on the website, you can see the PayPal donate, which is if you just want to do a one time donation, you can do it through PayPal. You don't have to have a PayPal account. You can use a debit card or credit card or whatever. And then there below that is a link to the Patreon. So. Yeah. Yep. And uh, give us reviews. That always helps us out in terms of uh, getting people to listen to the show. So thanks so much to all of you who have given us reviews. Yep. Keep on doing it, guys. Thank you so much. And if you if you write something with your review, if you just, you know, if you give us the stars and then you also write something, we'll read it on the show. So um, also we have a Facebook group. The Facebook is run by Jordan. Thanks so much, buddy. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for that kind of support. We love that. Uh, neither Kyle nor I are on Facebook, so to have somebody else run the sh uh, a fan run the Facebook group for us is great. The Watcher is in there though, and so is George Howard. Ah, yes. yes. And uh, Watcher, do you know how many people are in the Facebook group so far? Is it like three? <laughs> you got five people in there? Yeah, I think we're up to like 70, 80. Oh wow! Yeah, cool. Nice. Uh, Snake Force. That's right. <laughs> Snake Force is getting serious. All right. Also, History Shift. He just sent us the strange black object. <laughs> you can follow him. It at, is dark matter. That's right. It's dark matter. You can follow him at History Shift on Twitter. He also has uh, a YouTube channel. You can follow him. Look up History Shift on YouTube. He makes all of our YouTube videos and posts them there for us. So you can follow us on YouTube. Brothers of the Serpent YouTube. Uh, he also has a website, HistoryShift.com, where he details all of his adventures in finding things like the strange uh, dark, matter dark, matter, dark matter object and um, looking for dolmens and glacial erratics in Montana. And uh, he's also making some waves up there in terms of um, finding these things. He's getting some attention. I think he said he was getting he, a local paper asked to interview him. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And you know, like, how is he kicking the ass of the person who is actually selling tickets to people where he's giving it away now? <laughs> so, uh, and also running from Sam Squanch. So just read, <laughs> if you want to read about his his adventures doing that stuff, go to historyshift.com. And uh, that's it. I think we're done. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much to everybody. We, we love all the listeners. Love you. Good night, Adamu. Always have. Leave your jeans somewhere people can find them. Always what? <laughs> <laughs>